Thank you, sister. All right, let's get our Bibles up now. Uh, I'm going to mention something to y'all right quick. I might mention again Sunday. Been praying about something for a good while. This um, the house next door on the other side of the double wide. That's the original Tom Deal property. Has now finally come up. Uh, it's up for sale. And I sure wish one of y'all would buy it. If you would, we'd help you. It's got four acres of land, and we need that join our land really bad. So somebody wants to pray about that. Uh, that would want to be wonderful. Buy a house. We'll help you. And uh, or you you could buy it and, and rent it or whatever. I just, we just need the land because it joins our land there. So if somebody's interested in that, please let me know. And I'll tell you what, what, what we're thinking. Uh, all right. Uh, Colossians chapter number one again this evening. And we're going to get right into where we left off last week. Last week we had a wonderful study there and got up to about um, got up to about verse 22. And we talked about, we, we honestly didn't get a whole lot said about 21, about uh, before when we were before we saved, we used what we called alienated. So I'm not going to preach tonight uh, for, for you that maybe don't ever, maybe, maybe this is your first time coming on Wednesday night. We're going to slow down and teach and study the Bible. I am commanded to do that. Part of my job. The Bible said a bishop ought to be out, out to teach. Not, not like out not like to do anything. Out to teach. And so that's what we're doing here this evening. Here in the Bible, this is good for you. Slow down, look at the words of the Bible, and let it feed you. Reading the Bible is to your soul just what eating is to your body. You get up in the morning, you want to eat, eat food for your body. Reading the Bible is that for your soul. What it is. So, we'll look at we're alienated in our mind. Right? Verse 21, by wicked works. And every one of us like that. Them wicked things that we did before we got saved and since we got saved alienate your mind from the Lord. And yet now if you reconcile, we talked about that word reconciliation last week. But we've got to move on here tonight. Or we'll be hung up there all night again. Verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death, present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now look at verse 15. This is where the, the way the Lord wants to present us one day to get to the judgment seat of Christ is holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. That's his goal for us. God wants every one of us to be able to stand there and say, Glory to God, I fought a good fight. I done right. I served the Lord. And he said this, that's what he wants to do, verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, which is preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, here again, one of these verses, a verse like 23, is used by all the groups to teach you can lose your salvation as one of their proof texts. Because it said, see there? The Lord's going to present you unblameable at his, at his coming if you continue. Which obviously say, well, what if you don't? And that verse didn't say anything about going to heaven. It didn't say anything about salvation. It said he wants to present you unblameable and unreprovable. And he will if you'll continue grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Those two verses together, there again, you got to learn how to read the Bible. You say, how do you know that's reading that verse right, Brother Danny? Because all the other verses, that would be messed up if you read it the other way. So what he's saying is, I'd like to be able to present you holy and unblameable, right with God one of these days, and I will if you continue rooted and grounded. Hang in there. Um, now, don't mean be perfect. It don't mean you'll, you're you going to live a perfect life, but it means you you don't be moved away from the hope. You know, a lot of people are doing that. A lot of people are just giving up. They're just saying, good night, I just, just heck with it. I ain't going to try to live right no more. I ain't going to church no more. I just give up. And you don't do that. You stay in there. You stay in there. And you know, the devil, he can't do nothing with somebody that just won't quit. And can I encourage all y'all here this evening, um, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't give up. If you fall, ask the Lord to forgive you and get back up and get back in there. You say, well, Brother Danny, 
I, I heard that one man, they said he, he fell down in, in, the, in the mud and he got up and got all cleaned up and everything and he fell down again. <laughs> and he, he said, man, if I knew I was going to do this again, I'd just stay down here. And that's not the right attitude to have. A lot of Christians have that attitude. They said, my goodness, if I'd have just know I was going to sin this much, I wouldn't even try it. No, no. There ought to be something down inside you that fights and fights and fights and fights and fights. And no matter how many times the devil might trick you or trip you up or knock you in the mud hole, there's something in you that gets back up. It's your nature as a Christian to want to shake it off, you know. Like, you know, have you noticed that ever since you got saved, there's something in you that can't feel relaxed in sin like you used to before you got saved? I'm, I know I'm not the only one that's happened to. It. Millions of people feel the same thing. Like that little boy said, they said, have you quit sinning since you got saved? And I said, no, I'm not completely quit sinning, but it sure has complicated it. And that's right. You can't do it with a, with a, and, and get, lay down and go to sleep. It'll mess with your head. If you're saved and you're doing right, say like a, like a man, man, uh, uh, had a hog, and you've heard all preachers tell all these stories for years. And uh, he can take them, He said he had these hogs, and he took these two hogs out, and they loved to lay in mud. You know, hogs love mud. And I think I read that hogs hogs don't sweat. I think I read that. Is that true? That hogs don't they don't have sweat glands. That's why that ham pork's so bad for you. I reckon. I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the reasons. But anyway. They don't, they're just dry. They're just dry. And it's 100 degrees outside. Just an old dry. Ugh. Well, some people live down in the Hoppy Tom where we live. They had a big old fat hog. He's about that tall. And he laid in the yard all the time. They didn't even, he just out in the front yard. And he wasn't going nowhere. He couldn't. Uh, he, he'd get up and waddle over there, lay down in the shade and lay like that. And they'd feed him. And one day I went by and he's gone. So I reckon he got the coronavirus and killed him. Didn't get his getting vaccine or something. But uh, anyway, I guess they ate him. But hogs hog, love laying mud. Hogs love mud. And that guy went because it's cool. And they lay down in that wet mud and just lay there and it's cool. And he got them hogs out and he took them. And boy, he got his brush just like you'd wash a car. He sprayed them down with a water hose. Got his brush out and he scrubbed them. He scrubbed them, sprayed them off, scrubbed them. Got them, got their, got their hooves or whatever their toes or whatever they got and uh they and they and and they he rubbed them real good and then he got them real nice and clean and he got them a ribbon tied around their neck and now uh, he put baby powder on them sprayed them with some kind of uh perfume and he took them down to the circus or down to the fair and they said man i got the cleanest prettiest hog you ever seen in your life and everybody's amazed oh my goodness look at them they're little they're little old snout was uh, was uh, you know clean no 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 mud on them and everything, and uh, he took them things back home, went in the house, and he come out and started looking for them, and they were right back down there in that mud hole, just a wallowing around. You know why? That's their nature. That's their nature. Now a sheep, a sheep, you can take a sheep, and if it fall in the mud, and it it's like this, you know. Like that, I'm I'm not having a seizure, and I don't reckon. I'm, I'm, I'm shaking mud off, you know. I I got you know, and and I don't know how they do it. They can like a horse, they can move a certain muscle like that right there, like that, and they shake it off. They can't stand it. You know why? It's not in their nature. Sheep don't like mud. Hogs do, and that's why a lot of people have a hard time staying in church. There's still a hog in their heart. Their nature hasn't been changed. When you get saved, the Lord puts that sheep nature in you. And you might get in the mud, but something in you says, I'm getting out of this. This ain't good for me. I don't like this. And and I have you been in the mud since you've been saved, preacher? Yes, I sure have. But the whole time I was in it, I was shaking like this, and I was shaking like that. And I was saying, get this off of me, get this off of me. You don't feel right until you're clean. You don't feel right until you're clean. And that's what he's saying here. Stay that unmoved away from the hope of the gospel that I'm present you one of these days when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ that you'll be holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. And that, of course, means you ain't just been a hypocrite. You, you tried, you live right. Now, 
verse 23 there at the bottom of it, it said, we preach to every creature under heaven that they preach to everybody they possibly could. That's what that means. That don't mean that every single individual heard the gospel. I don't reckon. Uh, but it means he preached it to everywhere, to everybody. Verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up, watch it, verse 24, that which is behind the affliction of Christ in my flesh. He's talking about Christ's sufferings and his sufferings for his body's sake, which is the church. For his body's sake, which is the church. Now, if you haven't been saved long, you've got to learn this. The church, when we say church, most of the time people are talking about building. Are you going to church tonight? And we're talking about meeting together a place like this. But anybody that's been doing this a while knows what you mean when you say that. Uh, this building is not a church. It's a building where the church meets. I understand some of you have a long way past that, but some people in here are not. So I have to make it plain. This building right here, honestly, it's set apart for the Lord. But this, this stuff, all that is is wood. Nah, that's fake wood. And all that is is sheetrock. And all that is, is real. that's real wood. And all this is is some kind of fabric. And all, all this, all, it's, it, Jesus did not die for this stuff. Uh, the, the church is the people. The church is people. So that means this. If we all didn't even come in here, and we met out there in the parking lot. We all got together and prayed and sang and preached. We went to church. So you don't have to go to a building with a steeple on it to say I've been to church. As a matter of fact, there's people go to a building with a steeple on them every Sunday and don't go to church. Don't have church. So when we say church, we're talking about everybody who's saved and that's born again. And, and then sometimes we say, man, we had church tonight. And you know what people say. You know, you know, you mean what. You know what people mean when they say that? That means we had a good time, we fellowship, we worship, the preacher preached good, we had church. Actually, that's not a biblical concept, I don't guess, but uh, we, we have several different ways of using that word church. The truth is, every person in the world who's saved, who's been saved, is a part of his body. The head is in heaven. The body is on earth. We are his body. Now we together here are a local church. Shining Light Baptist Church. You can be in the local church and not be saved. But you can't be in his body without being saved. Uh, the Holy Ghost puts you in his body. You, you can write your name down and be a member of Shining Light Baptist Church. That ain't, that ain't going to help you none. Uh, but when you get saved, the Lord puts you in a part of his body. So... That's why we know the church ain't going down. A man can't drown with his head out of water. I don't care how deep it gets, brother. The head's in heaven and the body's on earth and we're not going down. You can't drown with your head out of water. And so uh, you you got to understand this thing about the church, which is his body sake. Now, uh, I'll say something here that some of our listeners online maybe don't know yet or don't understand. And there's a lot of people that would disagree with this. But any Bible-believing preacher would know that that the church, the body of Christ, uh, did not begin until toward the end of the ministry of Jesus. And we are now in what we call the church age. That means there was no church in the Old Testament, which is his body. There's a church in the book of Acts that said, talk about the church in the wilderness, but that's just that called out assembly. See, that church, that called out assembly in the, in the wilderness, that had mixed multitude in it. That people wasn't even saved or wasn't even going to heaven. Didn't offer the sacrifices. So the body of Christ, and, and you got, if you're going to understand the Bible, you got to get this, what I'm saying. You got to understand that the church, everybody in the world who's saved is the bride of Christ. We are engaged to Jesus Christ right now. All the Rules of marriage already apply to us during that engagement period. But the wedding has not taken place yet. One day there will be a wedding in the sky and we are all symbolically, the body of Christ, and we will marry her. 
God's, God's wife is Israel, God the Father. They, she's estranged right now, and they're having some problems. And, but the son, Jesus' wife, is the church. I know I'll get criticized for that because you start getting into that thing about Israel and the church, but honestly, I don't see how you can, I don't see how you can look at it any other way. I don't, I don't see how you can make Israel the church and the church Israel and spiritualize all them promises. I don't see how you can do that. I have friends that do it. I have friends that do it, and I I love them. And and I, but but I just don't. I can't see. Uh, he he didn't promise the church a piece of land on this earth, uh, and all kinds of stuff like that. We're not sons of Jacob. None of us are. We're not. Well, you might be. There might be a there might be a true blue physical Jew in here tonight, but I'm not. Don't reckon. I might have a little in me, but uh, uh, the the body of Christ began there at the end of the ministry of Jesus. The Holy Spirit came, baptized them people into the body of Christ, and that last to the Lord calls the church out. That's called church age. That day, church age that me and you are living in. And I'll get into dispensation here in a minute. We're going to hit it uh, in two or three more verses, 25, very next verse. And uh, you you got to understand that nobody... In the Old Testament, was born again in the sense that me and you are born again. Not circumcised, being a part into the literal body of Jesus Christ. He wasn't even, he didn't have a body in the Old Testament. He came pre incarnate appearances there, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but the Old Testament saints, uh, and people say, well, you just can't. I know people say, I don't believe in dispensation. Look, if, if there's no such thing as dispensations, we should be offering animal sacrifices right now. Right? You say, no, 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 Jesus took care of that. There you go. There's your dispensation. That's the meaning of the word. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, look, at, look at verse number 25. Where I've made a minister according to the dispensation. I know people that preach against us and me because they say, oh, you people are dispensationalists. Well, well, absolutely we are. How can you not be? How can you not be? Now, you can be hyper dispensational and chop it up so much you ain't got nothing left. But anybody who don't believe in dispensation, you, you can, you're confused. You have no idea what, you, what you're doing, people. Um, the, the meaning of dispensation is God's dealings with a certain group of people in a certain way in a certain time period. And if you can't see that, you're, you ain't going to get nowhere to understand the Bible. It's just going to be one big mangled up mess because uh, you've, got, you've got Adam and Eve didn't even have a Bible. You've got the people before the flood that didn't have a Bible. You've got the people after the flood that didn't have a Bible. Then you got the law, and you say, well, Brother Danny, they're all the same. Well, show me where Moses ever said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He never said that. Moses didn't know nothing about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew nothing about it. None of them Old Testament prophets. Now, they preached it as a shadow, but it was hid from them, as we'll see in a minute. A dispensation. Now, let me just say... Uh, uh, there are basically seven dispensations in the Bible, uh, and you can disagree or agree on some of these. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't fall out with somebody. It might be more or less, but uh, there's innocence there before Adam and Eve ever sinned. Obviously, they had it made right. The Lord didn't tell them to offer sacrifices. The Lord didn't tell them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Adam and Eve lived in the perfect garden. And by the way, we don't know how long Adam and Eve lived like that in that perfect environment. Might have been a little while. I don't know. So, that's a dispensation. And then there's the age of conscience after they sin. After they sin. How'd they know? What made Adam and Eve cover their self? All of a sudden, they're naked. You know, and it didn't bother them before they sinned. As soon as they sinned, they felt ashamed. That's your conscience. And your conscience is a, is a guide. You know, what, you know what your conscience is? You know how you feel bad when you do something wrong? Your conscience is pushing you to get right with God. And I've heard people say, well, um, uh, just as long as you go by your conscience. 
No, your conscience don't save you. Your conscience will point you to Jesus Christ. But you have the law of conscience. Then you have the law, the dispensation of civil government. That was Genesis after the flood. During that time there, they had the law written in their hearts, uh, the Bible said. And then there was a, uh, the uh, dispensation of promise, those Old Testament uh, priests and all. And then the law, when they had to bring the sacrifices to the temple and sacrifice for the sin. And then Jesus died on the cross. And then the age of grace, what me and you are living in now, the age of grace. That's why we don't bring sacrifices. If a person says, well, they're all the same, New Testament, Old Testament, everything's the same, God deals with everybody the same, well, you're, you're, uh, that's ridiculous. Uh, why don't, that's why we don't bring sacrifices. You know why we don't bring sacrifices up here and kill them Sunday morning? Because Jesus was our once and for all sacrifice. We are not Old Testament Jews in the, under the law. We are New Testament Christians under grace in the body of Christ. And if you can't see that, I, there ain't no hope for you ever getting the Bible figured out. Now, what makes so many, well, you know why there's so many de denominations? Because people take truths out of them dispensations and preach them in the wrong dispensation. Now, what I just said is major important. What I just said to you just now, 90% of the Christians, probably in Burke County, don't even realize. I'm going to say it again. The reason there's so many different denominations is people take scripture that belong, that scripture, I mean, they got scripture, they couldn't build a whole denomination, they didn't have a scripture, and preach it in the wrong dispensation. Like, like, build an ark. Does, has the Lord told anybody in here to build an ark? Because he no. He told one man to. He said, you got to build an ark, and in 120 years it's over with, you better get your family and everybody in there, going to drown you like a bunch of rats. Uh, now, he told us that. He told us that. He ain't going to do that no more. It's over. It's done. That's a dispensation. Now, all you people that are, are, would, or watch me at home or online, hear me out. Hear me out. If you believe that in the Old Testament they offered sacrifices and Jesus come and died in the New Testament and we don't offer sacrifices no more, you are a dispensationalist. You are. You, know, you might not believe there's but two, but you are a dispensationalist. And they write books. I've got friends. They send me texts. Lord have mercy. This Israel-Palestinian thing that's going on. Oh, there, i got friends. People send me texts. And they'll say, how in the world could anybody support Israel and all that? And, they, and I try to tell them, I say, look, 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 look. I don't support anything Israel does that's wrong. I don't support anything anybody does that's wrong. But I'm going to stick with what the Bible says. No matter who does what. And, and that's what you got to do. You can't. You can't base what you believe and preach off what's on the news. <laughs> you base on what the book says. So uh, we're, we're in dispensation. Now, uh, look at verse number 26. Here's, here's the day we're living in. Even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages. See, the Old Testament. And for generations, the Old Testament. But now is made manifest to his saints. The Old Testament saints did not know Jesus was going to die on the cross. And I'm going to say something that makes a lot of people mad, and a lot of good friends of mine don't like it. But, you know, I understand what they mean when they say the Old Testament saints got saved looking forward to the cross, and the New Testament saints got looking back to the back cross. I mean, that sounds good, and I know that it's well-meaning, but honest to goodness, that is not really scripturally right. They didn't know there was going to be a cross. You say, what about Isaiah? Isaiah didn't know it. He wrote it and didn't even know it. He, he was bruised for our iniquity. He was wounded for our transgression. All that. Isaiah didn't know that, that Jesus, God's son, was going to come. And pay. He, I don't even know if Isaiah realized what he was right. And so the Old Testament, it's like this. Let me see here. It's like this. Let me see. Um, I'll get you a chart one day, and I'll, I'll really, really illustrate it good. But it's like this. Let's say, let's say, um, this, this piece of paper right here was, uh, is, the, is the church. Let's say this piece of paper is the church. That's the church age. And this is the millennium and eternity. Now, the Old Testament prophets back there, they didn't even see this. It looked right over top of it and saw that. It was hid. I just read to you. It was hid from generations 
And uh, understand that. Get that in your head. It was hid from them. They couldn't see it. But now it's manifested to us. You, you know what you ought to do? You ought to shout your fool head off, people, because we got in on something good. But God opened the door for Gentile dogs like me and you to get in. Thank God, brother, we'd have been in a mess if he hadn't have done that. Thank the Lord that the door is open to the Gentiles. And so he sees right over top of it. And that's what the Old Testament prophets did. They saw right over, they saw over top the mountain peaks of prophecy and did not see the church, which is his body. Now, it's a mystery. Now, there are seven mysteries in the Bible. And I've preached on it before. I, well, I don't know if I've ever even preached it here since we've been in this building, but maybe I'll do it sometime. I should. Uh, there are seven mysteries in the Bible. A mystery is something that's hard to figure out, uh, hidden, veiled, and there's the mystery of godliness that Jesus manifests in the flesh. That's a mystery, 1 Timothy 3. There's the mystery of the Christian right here, uh, the body of Christ. Number three, there's a great mystery of Christ in the church, like a husband and wife. He said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. That's the third one. Number four, there's a mystery of God's dealing with Israel, Romans chapter 11. And he said, it's a mystery. Number five, there's a mystery in Revelation 17 of Babylon the Great, the great harlot there that God will deal with the tribulation. Number six, there's a mystery of iniquity, 2 Thessalonians 2. That's the Antichrist and the mark of the beast, and all the stuff that's coming. And then finally, number seven, there's the mystery of the rapture. 1 Corinthians 50, 15, 51, he said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Seven mysteries in the Bible. That'll preach, brother. That'll preach. And the Bible said we're to be good stewards of the mystery of God. So if you're a preacher, if you're a Sunday school teacher, we are to be good stewards. We're to take care of those seven mysteries and preach them and, uh, and help people with them. Let me hurry. Let me hurry. This mystery, verse 26, was hid from ages and from generations. Old Testament. But now is made manifest to his saints. What is it, preacher? To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Uh, the people in the Old Testament didn't have Christ in them. The Holy Spirit would come and go and come and go. And the Spirit of Christ sometimes would be in them and feel them do works and stuff. But it's different in the New Testament. In the New Testament, He comes in. He cuts you loose from that old sinful body. He puts you into the body of Christ. And He's a permanent resident. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. They didn't have that. That's why David said, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, he, that's why the Bible said the Spirit departed from Saul. That's why all those scriptures like that right there, they didn't have that permanent dwelling of the Holy Ghost that me and you have. Uh, so he said, verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom. Now, I'm going to stop right there before I do the second half of that verse. You know, basically, that's what I do. I warn and I teach. I warn and I teach. You'll hear me get up here some Sunday morning and I'll preach. You can be dead by 12 o'clock tonight and preach the whole time. I'm warning people. And then I teach like I'm doing tonight. My, and that's what Paul said I do. He said, warning every man and teaching every man. We're not, some, pe some preachers never don't do nothing but teach and they're messing up. And some don't do nothing but warn, they're messing up. We are to warn and teach. I'm supposed to warn people. The Lord's coming back. The devil, I, I do this all the time. I, all the time. I do it playing ball. Uh, every time we play ball, play ball Monday night at the Y in Marion. And I, I always tell this guy, Lord, I guard this little guy. And he wasn't about 13, 14. I was like, good night, man. I could be your great grandpa. What are you doing out here? Uh, but me and, me and him bumped into each other a little bit. And he cut my arm there a little bit. And he apologized. And I said, well, you should feel bad. You... No, I didn't. I didn't say. Uh, you, if you get out there, you deserve everything you get. Don't gripe. You get out there playing ball, don't cry about getting hurt. Amen? You're asking for it. And uh, you, you deserve everything you get if you get out there. So, uh, 
I tell them after it gets through, I said, uh, y'all go to church yesterday? Y'all go to church yesterday? And they'll say, yeah. I said, you know, the world going to hell. You know that, right? I'm warning every man. I'm doing what that scripture says. I'm warning every one of them. If I go get my tires rotated, I'm going to give them a track and say, you know, Jesus is coming soon. I'm warning them. And I'll say, I'll, uh, let's see, where was I the other day? I was somewhere. And it came up, it came up like the world's in bad shape. And I said, yeah, you know what's coming, right? And they said, no, what? I said, we're going to have a one world government, a one world monetary system, a one world religion, a one world military, a one world dictatorship, a one world church. And they said, really? And I said, yeah, I'm teaching every man. I'm warning every man. I'm teaching every man. And that's what he said. Warn every man. Teach every man. Everywhere you go. And people say, can you not talk without bringing up the Bible? And the answer is, no, we can't. Without that, there ain't nothing to talk about. If you can't talk about the Bible, there ain't nothing important enough to open your mouth over. And all God's people say it. That's right, brother. That's right. Tell me the, tell me the whole story again. I want to hear what the Bible says. I don't care about your opinion. Opinions are like armpits. Everybody got two and they both stink. <laughs> That's right. My opinion means nothing. Your opinion means nothing. But we're to warn every man, teach every man. Why? That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. There again, it didn't say sinless. It said perfect into a perfect man, right with God, mature Christian. Quickly, now I'm done. Verse 29. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working which worketh in me mightily. Lordy, mercy. You know what Paul's saying there? He said, I strive according to his working. And I don't know if you feel like this, but I do. I've always felt like, I've always felt like since I've been saved, the Lord's working. And I'm just along for the ride. I mean, I'm letting him use me and he, he's working and he works in me mightily. And that's, you ever seen a preacher get up? You remember when old Frankie is up here? I mean, he got plugged in at the youth, rat, I mean, at the camp meeting, and he was starting, you know, the Lord was working in him mightily. And you don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher. You, you get right with the Lord and full of the Holy Ghost, the Lord will work in you mightily. And let him do it. Let him do it. That's a, the greatest thing in the world to think, my goodness, God Almighty's using me. Hallelujah. What a blessing. So, we ought to do that and to, to that end. Preach, warn every man, teach every man. Okay? All right. Now we're in, we're done with chapter one. We'll uh, take up next time on chapter number two. And we'll take over that verse one about the uh, Laodicea. And we're really going to hit a verse in verse eight. So you can be studying that. Chapter two and verse eight. Isn't it something that a King James Bible? Printed in 1611, said, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Philosophy. But that's, that's 400 years ago. That's 400 years ago, y'all. Before there was a college or a university around here. And he said, Don't let them spoil you through philosophy. So we'll get on that next week. Okay? All right, let's bow our heads for prayer. Let's pray. Now, our heads bowed, eyes are closed. Right now where you sit, right there where you sit. If you do, is there something wrong? Maybe you need to ask the Lord to forgive you. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me for everything I've done wrong. God, forgive me and cleanse my heart. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you say, Lord, I want to I wanna warn every man and teach every man. Help me to do it at school tomorrow. Help me to be it at work. Not to be a, not to be a smart aleck, but just to do like the Apostle Paul said. Warn every man, teach every man. Warn them and teach them. Warn them and teach them. And maybe you're here tonight, and you say, Brother Danny, I need to get in my Bible, and I need to say, tell the Lord that. Let's all tell the Lord right now what we need. Father, I thank you, Lord, so much for all you've done for us. Pray now that you bless every single person here this evening. God, do what ought to be done in our lives. Lord, we love you. I pray you'd meet with us this weekend, Lord, as we go visiting, and then for church this weekend, and then for the uh, revival on Monday. I pray the Holy Ghost will come down and do a great work in our hearts. We'll thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, just before you go now, uh, I'd like to know everybody who's planning on going down there Monday who needs a ride. <laughs>